Well, this is the day. This is the day that many people will say is their favorite day of the year. Show of hands, is this your favorite day of the year? Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, maybe? How, well, informal poll. How many of us open presents on Christmas Eve? That's like your main night. How about Christmas Day? How many of you in the month of December, just every day, there's a different, right? <laughs> and why not, you know, on the 25th day of Christmas? I gave to me because 70% of people, <laughs> you've heard that statistic, right? 70% of people, when they go Christmas shopping for other people, buy something for themselves too. Maybe not for a Christmas present. It's, oh, I just need this or something like that. But I mean, we do, we shop for ourselves. So it's our favorite time of the year for many people. You ever wondered what it is about this time that makes it a favorite for so many people? I mean, is it the food? Is it the, uh, the gatherings with family? Is it maybe the absence of family? I mean, maybe you've got decorations all squared away and travel arrangements made. And it's conceivable that whether you had to pay to fly all the family in or maybe your present to yourself is to fly all the family away, you know, to go visit other... <laughs> Here, kids, go see Grandma and Grandpa for a week or whatever. No, true story. When I was growing up, my grandparents, my dad's parents, lived in 29 Palms. And so they lived out in the desert. They had this homestead, you know, five acres of land, which was, you know, four and a half acres of rocks and snakes and stuff. And, and every year, at the week between Christmas and New Year's and the first week in August, we were sentenced. I mean, we were sent out to go visit my <laughs> grandparents. And I could never figure out why until I realized, oh, because my mom was a teacher and she that week off, and so she and dad wanted to just have some time alone, and then the first week in August, you know, which is a great time to go to 29 Palms, uh, <laughs> that was their anniversary, so, you know, there's a little self-care for the marriage there, so I mean, sometimes maybe, you know, the best gift you can give to your marriage is to send your kids away for Christmas, but there, there are favorite things that we like. When you talk about what is your favorite thing, though, that means that something gets a higher place than something else, right? I mean, there are certain movies that people like that are identified as Christmas movies. We always watch that this year. Can anyone explain why Die Hard is on the list? I mean, that comes up every year. You want to? Yeah, that's what I hear, right. Yeah, and it's funny because if you ask people who like that movie, they're like, yeah, it just is, duh. You know, I'm like, okay. Well, <clears throat> for being, coming from a musical family, I still can't figure out why the song My Favorite Things is a Christmas song. From Sound of Music, right? I mean, right? I mean, it has nothing to do with Christmas in the actual stage production or the movie. And look at the lyrics. Raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens and uh, something else that goes to moon on their wings and doorbells and sleigh bells. On. Are those your favorite things? Warm woolen mittens? Well, I mean, we're in California, so we don't care about warm woolen mittens. We want big, heavy, you know, North Face jackets when it gets to be 60 degrees. But, I mean, if you think... I don't see any of those things on that list as being my absolute favorite things, though I just bumped into my son out in the parking lot. I'm sorry? That's right. Well, but seriously, I mean, I don't get excited at Christmas time. Okay, re uh, raindrops on roses look really pretty. Whiskers on kittens, if your cat doesn't have whiskers, they're going to fall, okay? Seriously, my son, when he was a couple years old, we had a little kitten, and he decided it would be fun to see what it would look like if Chloe had half of her whiskers cut off, and so he just cut them off. And so I wake up in the morning, and I see her, she's walking into the refrigerator, just like that. I'm like, what is she doing? I pick her up, and whiskers on this side are out here, whiskers right here, right there. So I don't think of Christmas when I think of whiskers on kittens, I think of balance, you know? <laughs> but these are all things that we're told are our favorites. I mean, it's Christmas time, and this is a favorite time of year. What does exactly favoritism mean? Well, when I mentioned the word favoritism, I know exactly where we went to. And not just because it's in your bulletin. Mom likes you best, right? That's going to happen at Christmas in some families. You could be 50 years old. Doesn't really matter, you know. You're going to sit there and watch, and how much, you know, did mom make her favorite dessert? You know, did mom give him extra helpings with this? How much did everybody get for Christmas? That favoritism. And you see it in jobs, you see it in the workforce, you see it in school, you know, teacher's pet, that type of thing, that favoritism. Well, you know, I think it's actually a biblical concept. And we see it start to play out in Luke chapter 1. I mean, think about this, though. You have experienced a certain measure of favor from God because you've been called by God. As much as you'll hear from pulpits all across America and all over the world, you need to make a decision for Christ, it's like, oh, wait a minute, who makes that decision? I mean, it is a gift to be called a child of God, to be called to that fellowship. Think about your sinful nature. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Scripture tells us. 
While we were yet sinners, Jesus Christ died for us, miserable, sinful, ungodly people. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, and at Christmas time we celebrate the fact that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, the one who saves, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's quite a really remarkable transaction, and it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with him. I don't think in our sinful selves we could actually even receive it. You get right down to it. I mean, any more than your three-year-old can carry fine china from the cabinet into the dining room without dropping it. I mean, (laughs) some moms are going, yeah, that would never happen in my house. Other people are saying, fine china, what is that? Something that has tremendous value. I can't handle it in my sinful self. God has to do something in my heart so that I have the capacity to receive it. And so we take a look at Mary and this whole concept of favor, and we can see two different ways that favor is described in Luke chapter 1. In chapter 20, or verse 28, she is referred to as highly favored. And in verse 30, God has favor. Now, while this is happening here in Luke, because Luke focuses more on Mary's lineage, uh, Matthew has the, uh, the, the Joseph story takes it through the, uh, the, the masculine lineage there too. And Gabriel has a conversation with Joseph the same way he has a conversation with Mary. The conversation with Joseph is actually kind of funny. Joseph, you have one job, okay? Well, first of all, don't divorce Mary because a betrothal back in Jesus' day was a legally binding deal. It's not like what's going to happen this Christmas where you're going to look at your social media accounts and you're going to see some giggly girl going like this because some guy... Right? You've seen the pictures, right? Mm-hmm. You know, because she, there's a ring on her finger. That's why she's pointing. Because she got engaged. It's so exciting. And we're so happy until maybe the engagement doesn't work out. And six months later, we're super sad and in Vegas with all our girlfriends because, we're, oh, it didn't work. And the ring is either... <laughs> and they either give the ring back to the guy or the ring winds up you know, in the garbage disposal or in the ocean or something like that, depending on the quality or lack thereof of the diamond. And... <laughs> But if that happens, right, what happens? It's between two consenting adults. He offered her a ring. Then the engagement didn't work. He gets the ring back or she throws it down the toilet. And that's it, right? There's no harm, no foul. But in Mary and Joseph's day, this was a legally binding thing. This betrothal was quite a big deal. And to be betrothed meant if he was going to divorce her from an engagement, yeah, from a betrothal, he had to do it. He was going to do it privately. And he's just, I'm just going to, you know, it's not her fault that she's pregnant, et cetera, et cetera. And the angel says, don't divorce her, marry her, name him Jesus. You got that? Okay. Now, in Mary's case, the angel shows up and says, okay, let's talk about this favor and highly favored. In verse 30, where he talks about the favor, that literally just means kind of leaning in, like, I favor you. Like, you go to the restaurant, and you've got a reservation, and they lost it, and you look really pathetic, and the waiter goes, okay, I got a table over here. Shows you his favor. Or maybe, you know, you're in class and for some reason the teacher says, you know what, that Marsh kid's quite a hard worker. I'm going to make sure that he gets extra credit because I just think he's a good guy. Said none of my teachers ever, by the way. (laughs) But they show favor. That's all that literally means. The the words like grace, charis, it just means favor. But in verse 28, where he says, blessed are you, Mary, who is highly favored, that's a whole different word, charitu. It literally means there's an exchange going on here. It means that God is showing favor to Mary and Mary is receiving that favor and responding. Think of that same professor and that same college student. And the professor shows, yeah, says, you know what, I like you. you know, come meet with me in my office afterwards and let's have some conversation. And the student starts responding, hey, this guy has got the trajectory for my career path and if I learn from him and he pours into me and then we've got this exchange going on, now it's not just a question of him saying, hey, you know what, you're my favorite student and the student going, great, I'll never come to class and not turn in my assignments and still get an A because you like me. But I don't have any relationship with you. You're just showing favor to me. But the word for highly favored literally means that there's some kind of reciprocity going on here. That God's showing favor to Mary and Mary's ready to receive it. And you can tell that reception by the way she responds to the angel. First she's disturbed. Then she says, how can this be? As a matter of fact, we see three different reactions from Mary that we can see ourselves in too. The first is the favorably unfavorable. Do any of us deserve God's favor? 
apart from Christ. I mean, seriously, do we? I love you all. No, not a bit do we deserve it. It's completely unmerited. I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. It's a free gift from God. It's wonderful. In Mary's case, we see this happen. Was she any better than anybody else? No, but she was the one that God says is highly favored. And secondly, there's that distressing disturbance. You look at verse 29, and she's perplexed. What the heck is this? I'm 16 years old, or 15, or 13, or 19. I'm getting ready to get married to a guy who's older than me. I'm already engaged to him. It's a legally binding contract. And now you're telling me I'm going to get pregnant by a spirit? What the heck is that? That would be rather disturbing. I've experienced a little of my own disturbance this past year. Maybe you have too. Something that was really rock solid in your life, and then all of a sudden God steps in and says, no, we're going to disturb that a little bit. We're going to mess things up a little bit. Because we're going in a different direction. If you've dri driven past the Laguna Hills Mall or what's left of it recently, you know, there's a bit of a disturbance there too. I think about half of it's now gone because they're trying to rebuild it and remold it. And it'll probably all be apartments before we know it. In my case, it's with my health. I haven't had a health, real serious health problem in 55 years. Spent more time in front of doctors and more money on medicine this year than I have in the other 55 combined, which is kind of a hint that I'm 37 and that's where the 55 comes from. <laughs> Glad you appreciate that. <laughs> I was in the hospital earlier this year for sepsis, which is a ton of fun. I highly don't recommend it. And uh, about five or six days on some pretty heavy antibiotics, another month on antibiotics, and my body was really kind of beaten up, but depleted and coming back around. And then I was going in for a routine physical for a life insurance policy. And uh, the life insurance company said, hey, your EKG looks a little irregular. And so you really should have a follow-up on that. And also, did you know that the hospital wanted you to have a follow-up on the CT scan they did of your lungs back in January when they discovered the nodules on your right lung? The what? <laughs> the nodules? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll go back for that scan. So they scan the lungs. There's a couple more nodules, but they're teeny tiny. They're really not that harmful. They're probably scar tissue, we think. Now I have a pulmonologist. Doesn't that sound really important? And then... <laughs> And then he, he asked me if I had a cardiologist. I said, yeah, I said, that's good, because the scan of your heart looks really weird. He goes, I'd be careful with that aneurysm if I were you. <laughs> what? Yeah, you know, now I can spell thoracic. That's kind of weird, and it's not spelled like Jurassic. It's weird to have something with an S sound in it that has two Cs and no S, but uh, it, an ascending thoracic aneurysm, which for those of you who've ever had heart issues, know that that can be kind of a drag. Now, we don't know where that came from, if there's a history of heart problems in my family, and if there is, my family will never tell. Uh, that's, we're one of those families that joke with my mom and dad, and if you're watching on Facebook Live, hi, mom and dad, is that we're gonna get an email from them three weeks after they're dead, saying, you know, the service was lovely, we know you guys are busy, we didn't wanna bother you. you know? <laughs> that's how much my family talks about medical stuff. So, uh, you know, now I'm kinda asking questions like, mom? Did grandma die of a heart attack? And when did you start taking heart medication? Well, I was in my 50s, but it's really better now. I'm like, I'm in my 50s, what the heck? Well, the pulmonologist said, well, don't worry about it, though, because, you know, it, it, when it gets to five centimeters, that's when we have to do open heart surgery. I said, well, where am I? He goes, four and a half, so you're fine. I'm like, <laughs> okay. So now we're learning how to live with that. And we'll take more scans, and I did the old stress test the other day, and Dan, I went through with flying colors. I was thinking about you all the way. I had Dan in my ear saying, you got this, you got this, you know. Especially when they shoot the second thing in your arm with the whatever, isn't that great? Gives you a warm, tingly feeling. It's just, can't, it's, it's indescribable. But all of a sudden, I just started saying, da, 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 because it's radiation, you know. And so, <laughs> it was wild. Distressing, maybe disturbance, Yeah. Prayer life changes a lot when you're having moments like that. If you've had medical experiences, I'm sure you are well aware of waking up at 2.37 a.m. on a hospital gurney with two IVs in your arm, and you can't sleep because a stupid alarm keeps going off every 36 and a half minutes. And the prayer itself, yep, mm-hmm, amen, yeah. <laughs> we get Southern Baptist around it now. This could have been a really deal breaker for Mary, Instead, it's kind of a game changer for her. And then you see the possibility and the impossible. 
she asks, how can it be? And Gabriel begins to explain how it can be. The Holy Spirit will come and the word overshadow. Literally just means to cover. In the same way that like you're out in a really hot sun and it's blazing and you're looking for some kind of relief and then here comes a cloud at this really random time that just blocks the sun just long enough you kind of go, ah. Think of that cover being over Mary. It's the same word actually you see in Genesis 1-2 where God is, you know, the earth is formless and void. That tohu and bohu sounds kind of cool. And God's hovering, verse 2, over what hasn't been created yet. But he's hovering with care and concern. He's about to create. He's about to create something wonderful. Because God's plans are never to harm us, but to heal us and to build us and to create something out of nothing. And it's, it's a wonderful exchange. And, and Gabriel's explaining this to Mary, and Mary's receiving this. She's receiving it because of this charitude that's in her heart that said, yes, when God's speaking this into your life, I'm going to receive it. And so she does. And out of her reaction, we see three different expressions that I think are germane to all of us as Christians. We see her faith, we see her faithfulness, and then we see fruitfulness. Look at verse 38, Mary's response, before she gets into her Magnificat, verse 39, the rest of the way, the song that she sings and how wonderful and how blessed she is. She says, I am your servant, or I'm your bondservant. Some translations, I am your slave. Angel just appears out of nowhere, tells her this, and she says, I am your servant. I will go. You can see that connection right there. She's responding supernaturally. Naturally would have been, wait a minute. I'm not so sure about this. You're telling me I'm going to have to give up my marriage or face ridicule and scorn, and you're doing this to me, and what if I don't want that? What if Mary had said no? We wouldn't be here right now. But she wasn't going to say no. That's the point, because of what God had already done in her heart. We see her faith. And then we see her faithfulness at the end of that verse. Let it be with me. Let it be as you say. Let it be. Let it be what God's will be in my life. Faithfulness doesn't go anywhere. We can all sit here and talk about how much faith we have in God. Faithfulness is manifest in what we do with that faith. How we act based on that faith. And that faith which manifests in faithfulness, leads to fruitfulness, as Terry was reading from Romans 16. And Paul talking about the message that is preached. And you see that the message is preached, the word of God will not fail, it comes back full. It accomplishes its work. It bears fruit. Take a look back, this might be a good opportunity this year, I mean, if you'd still use pen and paper, or if you want to do electronic, keep a journal, like a spiritual diary, Just how God is working in your life and things that you've been called to do over the course of the next year. And then go back next Christmas or next New Year's Eve and read it. Don't look at it as you're writing. I mean, well, look at it as you're writing. Otherwise, you'll have, you know, cats on the keys and that might be illegible. But, I mean, read it so that you can, read it, write it so you can read it. But then don't look back at it until like maybe a year later and go back and take a look and see what God's done. Do a little fruit inspection and see. I guarantee you, you're not the same person spiritually today that you were a year ago or five years ago, or 10 years ago. There's been growth, you've seen it, you know. Other people can see it too. The corollary to that is, if you don't see it, the question is, why not? You're either moving forward or moving backward. There is no standing still in God's economy. And Mary shows us that. That same cloud that's overshadowing her, that same spirit that's overshadowing her, is overshadowing you. It did overshadow you when you received the gift of salvation. It overshadows you everywhere you go. It guides you. It leads you. It's not just for her. Let's not come to the manger tonight and go, wow, Mary, good job. That was awesome. Joseph, way to go. This is really cool. When's dinner? See, her faith is kind of a blueprint for how your faith has been manifest. I mean, that's the beauty of all of this, right? I mean, Mary's life goes from absence of God to presence of God to fulfillment of God's word in about three verses there. And now she goes from being just kind of an observant Christian to a confessing apostle, as we all do too. God did not rescue you from your sins so you can sit on the bench and hope to get in the game at some point. Which brings us back to this whole thing about favorites. 
and favoritism. Isn't that wild to think of the fact that God would look at you or look at me and say, you're my favorite? My logical brain says that's not possible because there's only one favorite, right? But if you think of it in terms of the way he spoke to Mary, highly favored, you see the connection and how beautiful it is. Yes, God does play favorites. And that's why we're all here. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for the favor that you've shown us and how highly favored we are just as Mary responded to your call. Our lives have been touched and impacted in that way too. Thank you, Father, for the gift of salvation that can only come by grace through faith in your Son. Thank you for allowing us to receive it and now the compulsion that we have. It's a privilege to receive it. It's our duty to share it. May we move in faithfulness to become more fruitful. In Jesus' name.